Donc, merci d'être avec nous ce soir pour euh, la conférence inaugurale. Donc, je le disais, j'ai énormément de chance d'être entouré euh, de représentants et d'activistes euh, de différents mouvements européens, euh, pan-européens ou pas d'ailleurs, euh, qui vont aujourd'hui nous faire un retour d'expérience. Et je pense que c'est ça qui est intéressant. Euh, c'est la façon dont on apprend euh, de ce qui est en train de se passer. Euh, donc c'est essentiellement de cela dont on va parler aujourd'hui donc autour de moi j'ai Nicolo, Nicolo Milanese excusez-moi je prends mes notes parce que je ne connais tout, pas tout par cœur qui est le coprésident d'Alternative Européenne une organisation de, so de la société civile dont l'objectif est d'explorer le potentiel transnational de la politique et de la culture en Europe vous faites aussi partie d'un réseau d'activistes euh, et d'innovateurs culturels euh, et vous contribuez et vous avez contribué ou vous contribuez euh, à la marge ou pas d'ailleurs vous allez nous raconter à un nouveau mouvement politique qui s'appelle euh, Diem 25 Diem 25 qui a été monté par euh, Yanis Varoufakis euh, Slazov Sizek Julian Assange et d'autres et dont le but ou le motto est de dire quel que soit les inquiétudes que leur inspire leur compétitivité mondiale, les flux migratoires et le terrorisme, un seul risque terrifie vraiment les pouvoirs qui tiennent l'Europe, la démocratie. Euh, je précise que vous êtes aussi poète. Euh, Andreas Karitsis, vous êtes un ancien membre, merci d'être là, vous êtes un ancien membre du comité central de Syriza, que vous avez quitté euh, en août 2015, et ce, après... Euh, euh, des années et des années d'engagement politique dans d'autres formations qui ont pu accoucher de Syriza. Vous nous raconterez notamment ce que vous avez vécu et quelles expériences et quelles leçons vous en tirez euh, aujourd'hui. Euh, il y a aussi Birgitta Yandostir, que je suis très heureuse d'avoir avec nous. Vous êtes poète, éditrice, volontaire de Wikileaks et vous êtes aussi députée islandaise depuis 2009, réélue en 2013, sous la bannière du parti pirate que vous avez importé en Islande. Euh, le parti pirate, aujourd'hui doté de près de 43% des intentions de vote aux prochaines législatives, et je précise que cela n'a rien à voir avec les Panamalix, puisque cette cote de popularité s'est installée au cours des deux dernières années. Et il y a aussi Tuan et Isabelle. Euh, vous êtes membre du collectif Ma Voix, qui est un mouvement euh, citoyen, une initiative citoyenne qui a démarré il y a un peu plus d'un an, ou un peu moins d'un an, qui vise à faire élire au Parlement en 2017, des citoyens comme vous et moi, c'est-à-dire absolument pas des professionnels de la politique, qui seraient tirés au sort parmi des volontaires qui s'engagent à deux choses. La première, c'est à, à se consacrer pleinement à leur activité de député, ce qui n'est pas toujours le cas, et à deux, encore moins, à représenter leurs électeurs, notamment en votant en fonction des consignes de vote des internautes réunis sur la plateforme. Bref, c'est une initiative de démocratie liquide, entre autres. Donc, je vous l'ai dit, nous avons autour de cette table quatre expériences récentes, voire émergentes, citoyennes, de réappropriation de la parole politique, voire du projet européen, voire du pouvoir politique, pour ce que ça veut dire. Quatre expériences à des stades différents de maturité, qui sont toutes des réponses au déficit démocratique, pour le dire poliment, en Europe aujourd'hui. C'est l'occasion pour nous de faire un point sur ces tentatives, d'en comprendre les origines, les visions, les limites et les failles, euh, et d'analyser finalement, et je crois que c'est le plus important, la courbe d'apprentissage à l'œuvre. Mais avant tout, euh, je voudrais faire un petit tour d'horizon pour qu'ils vous présentent avec leurs propres mots ce qu'ils sont en train de faire, euh, leur expérience. Et euh, je voudrais savoir pourquoi elles apparaissent aujourd'hui. Je vais passer à l'anglais parce que ça va être la langue de travail entre nous aujourd'hui, là. Euh, et je vais me tourner vers Nicolo. Mais il parle très bien français d'ailleurs. <rire> Je ne sais pas quand, dans quelle langue vous allez répondre. Um, why are all these movements emerging now? Um, basically, we need some context here. Thanks. I'll, I'll speak in English. I'm a little bit clearer. Um, I think that if you ask me why are all these movements emerging now, the answer is because we have very short memories. Um, and I mean that in a couple of senses. One sense is that there is, of course, as we all know, a strong dissident tradition throughout Europe that is, in fact, uninterrupted over many hundreds, if not thousands of years, and which has had its manifestations 
only very, very recently, if we think about the fall of the Berlin Wall, the democ democratization of large parts of Europe, if we think about the aftermath of the Yugoslav Wars, we think about dictatorships which were installed in different parts of Europe. Um, we're talking only yesterday about very powerful experiences of uh, democratic uprising and dissident activity. And I see um, the current movements as uh, a continuation of that, and we should uh, actively claim that uh, heritage of dissident activity for democracy in Europe as our own and not allow it to be appropriated by other forces which had nothing to do with it. Um, secondly, though, there is a kind of historical amnesia, which unfortunately is promoted, I would say, in our education systems. Uh, and the fact that we think that movements are new, that we actually have to relearn a whole series of ways of claiming popular power um, says something quite damning about the situation of our civic education uh, in Europe, I would say. I think for those reasons, because its memory is so important, I have some reservations about the title that's given um, to this European Lab Forum, which I'm very happy is happening, and I'm very happy to be here. But I think that Europe de la culture année zéro um, is to be treated with some um, complexity because, thankfully, it is not an zéro. Uh, there's a whole heritage there behind us we should draw on. Thankfully, also regrettably, because, of course, uh, Europe has its beautiful side. The goddess Europa was beautiful in the myth. Europe also has its violent side. The goddess Europa was abducted by Zeus, and we are perhaps we have been living over these past couple of years a new abduction. My last remark in answer to your question with regards to the form of some of the new movements um, is that I think over the past couple of years in particular in Europe, many people through re-engaging in the democratic process, through uh, relearning that democracy does not come for free any more than uh, digital services come for free. You end up paying for them at some point. Uh, and the choice is how you want to pay for them. But through re-engaging in that process, uh, people have come to realize that the real battles uh, facing this continent, facing large parts of the world, are transnational. And so we do need to uh, reinvent, if not invent, uh, ways of working together across borders. Um, uh, and of course, the internet is an important part of that. Uh, but there are other ways of, of linking up on the, on, on the ground uh, in reality. In, uh, that uh, we've been learning over the past years, and that learning process is, is only really now starting to kick in, I would say. Uh, perhaps too late, perhaps inevitably too late, but thankfully, we are learning. Um, so, as you mentioned, we are on a learning curve. Um, but before that, I would like to um, go to you, to your growth movement, and um, because you are proposing solution in a different ways. So I will start by you, Birgitta. According to you, what is it that we need to crack uh, the system and to restore democracy today? And how is it that piraters, the, party pir uh, the pirate parties in, uh, in Iceland, uh, how is it that it is approaching it? Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me here. Um, and uh, thanks for this debate, because it is very important. Um, and the reason why the Pirate Party is popular, we are, it was just a freak shot up to 43%. Uh, our support base would probably be in election around 25 to 30, which is of course huge because we only have 5% uh, when we were elected uh, in 2013, and we were created in 2012. Um, I sense that people are really uh, ready for some transformative changes that are still slightly conservative. <laughs> so the wa best way to describe the Pirate Party in Iceland is uh, radical technocrats uh, with an anarchistic uh, flavor. Uh, because we really want to promote um, the possibility for the general public to have the legal tools to participate. But that in itself is not enough. 
So what you also need is that you have to make proper laws that encourage whistleblowing, that uh, uh, allows the general public and the media to have access to information and to process the information. Um, another thing that I discovered when I went into the parliament like a hacker was that uh, none of the parliaments in Europe or in the world work the way they should or were intended to work. Uh, the parliaments and the democracies uh, process is a little bit like dictatorship with many uh, heads uh, resting on a corporate body. And, uh, and I say that because our laws, the process around how the laws are made is very uh, opaque. There is very little transparency about it. And some people say, oh, it's like a sausage. You don't want to know what's in it. But yes, I want to know what's in the sausage. And the best way to know what's in the sausage and to reach a consensus and get out of this majority, minority uh, cluster fuck is to uh, make the parliament the true seat of um, uh, legislation uh, because the parliament is much closer to the general public. So you ha can have active voting, liquid democracy in a much more functional way. Currently, most par parliaments are like a processing machine for the executive, whereas the executive should be uh, executing the laws from the parliament. So you see, uh, I've become like a, a completely uh, technocratic uh, when I think about how to revolutionary change Iceland. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to French because they are French and they will answer in French. <laughs> Donc, euh, Isabelle et Juan, euh, vous êtes les deux représentants de Mavoie euh, à Lyon. Donc, Mavoie est ce mouvement euh, complètement émergent. Euh, sur quel euh, constat est-ce que le mouvement est basé et qu'est-ce qu'il essaye de casser ou qu'est-ce qu'il essaye de hacker Puisque, effectivement, le, le mot d'ordre des fondateurs, enfin, s'il y en a, parce que j'ai compris qu'il ne fallait pas dire fondateur, mais... L'esprit du, 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 de, de ce mouvement, c'est de dire on va hacker l'Assemblée nationale. Donc, comment ça marche Tout d'abord, ben, merci euh, de nous avoir invités. Euh, on, on est tous les deux ici, mais ça, ça pourrait être la prochaine fois euh, tout à fait deux autres personnes, puisque nous sommes un mouvement euh, complètement dépersonnifié. Et donc là, c'est le hasard qui fait que c'est Isabelle et Toine aujourd'hui. Et la prochaine fois, vous aurez d'autres interlocuteurs. Euh, on vous invite à un changement total de paradigme, puisque notre présence ici en tant que citoyen auprès de personnalités euh, politiques euh, exprime déjà euh, ce changement. Donc merci. Euh, les Actuellement, le constat qu'on peut faire en France, en tous les cas, c'est qu'on a une démobilisation totale des citoyens par rapport à la, à la, par rapport à la politique. Beaucoup d'abstention. Hein, on a vu euh, aux dernières législatives euh, de Nantes, euh, Loire-Atlantique, euh, 70% d'abstention, euh, ce qui est énorme. Euh, et nous avons aussi euh, actuellement un système qui est à bout de souffle. Ce que le ressenti des citoyens exprime, c'est un mal-être. C'est actuellement une incompréhension. C'est des gens qui sont dans la peur. Les peurs figent. Donc on a besoin de mettre du mouvement. Euh, le mouvement, justement, euh, Ma Voix, euh, a comme objectif d'impliquer euh, le plus possible les citoyens en leur donnant euh, la possibilité de faire entendre euh, leur voix. Comment Peut-être tu peux rentrer dans, dans la partie un peu pratique, Toan Alors, avant d'expliquer comment... Euh, J'aimerais d'abord vous présenter trois fondamentaux sur lesquels on s'appuie, tant pour fonctionner entre nous que pour présenter les choses, que pour fonctionner même en public avec vous et faire participer tout le monde. Le premier fondamental, c'est... Alors, on l'utilise en hashtag, en slogan, pour se donner du courage, c'est « on est ensemble ». Le « on est ensemble »,« we are together euh, ». Il, est, il peut paraître euh, gentillet, tout ce que vous voulez. Euh, il s'appuie sur l'intelligence collective, sur le fait que, euh, forcément, à plusieurs, on va être plus compétent, plus confiant que tout seul. Euh, le deuxième fondamental, euh, qui est très important, c'est on avance en marchant. Ma voix est une, une, 
expérimentation. Pardon. Du coup, on va se tromper, euh, on va tomber, on va se relever, mais on va apprendre. Et autant l'objectif de 2017 peut être important, mais le chemin que l'on va parcourir va être extrêmement important. On va apprendre beaucoup de choses, on va monter en compétences, on va rencontrer beaucoup de gens. Et ça fait partie, euh, ça fait partie des choses que nous, on considère comme importantes. Et le dernier fondamental que je voudrais, euh, que je voudrais vous présenter, c'est la confiance a priori. On part entre nous, et même avec les autres, avec vous, avec, euh, avec le public, en confiance. Alors, ce n'est pas une confiance aveugle, c'est une confiance a priori. C'est-à-dire que grâce à ce mot, grâce à, à, à cette notion, on instaure un climat euh, d'abord de bienveillance, mais un climat aussi propice à la création, à l'imagination et à la motivation. On n'a jamais eu autant de personnes motivées qui viennent frapper à la porte de ma voix et pour, dire, pour, nous, pour nous demander qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire avec vous. Et je peux vous dire que euh, Isabelle, comme moi, comme d'autres, euh, on passe beaucoup de temps sans compter justement à cause de ce climat-là. Il vient aussi de rajouter de façon un peu générale, c'est que l'avantage de, des, des temps actuels, c'est que l'information circule. Donc euh, on a actuellement la chance de pouvoir nous appuyer euh, sur tout ce qui est nouvelle technologie et se dire aussi que maintenant les citoyens sont plus informés. Euh, L'autre chose aussi qui est un, très important pour nous, c'est d'avoir de, de, la logique du bottom-up et de pouvoir maintenant euh, pré, pré, euh, préfigurer, enfin relancer en fait de nouveau euh, les citoyens dans leur rôle avec la problématique que les citoyens en France actuellement ont un problème de place. Et donc, ce qu'on souhaite, le pari, en fait, de ma voix, c'est de redonner euh, aux citoyens sa place au cœur des institutions et au cœur de là où on crée réellement euh, le pouvoir. Euh, ce que Birgitta tout à l'heure euh, était en train euh, d'évoquer, c'est que peu à peu, euh, on a aussi en France eu une déviance des textes qui finalement font que euh, nous, citoyens, bah, on n'a plus du tout euh, d'avis à donner euh, par rapport à ça et c'est ce qu'on voudrait réellement changer avec la confiance a priori, la bienveillance, et le pari aussi que euh, la démocratie peut être au service du vivre ensemble et non pas la démocratie utilisée euh, comme étant euh, source de clivage. Alors je vous invite à, à regarder une expérience que ma voix est en train de conduire, parce que c'est des très belles intentions, mais c'est aussi une confrontation au réel qui euh, n'a peur de rien. Donc il y a une, une élection législative à Strasbourg euh, dans quelques semaines. Ils ont décidé, après un vote sur Internet, de se lancer. Donc ils ont euh, euh, recueilli des candidatures. Les gens se sont présentés à moyennant euh, des petits films dans lesquels on ne voyait pas leur visage. Euh, en disant pourquoi ils voulaient se présenter par ma voix, euh, en disant quelles étaient leurs intentions. Euh, ils vivent une potentielle élection comme un vrai job. Donc... Euh, c'était intéressant parce que euh, ma voix a fait une ap un appel à candidat comme on ferait un, un appel à candidature pour un vrai boulot. Les gens ont répondu euh, comme une espèce de lettre de motivation, mais euh, émotionnelle, j'ai envie de dire, et, et, et intellectuelle et euh, idéologique aussi. Euh, et ils ont lancé donc leur campagne, ils ont imprimé leurs affiches. Je vous invite à regarder les affiches qui sont en elles-mêmes. Euh, quelque chose qui va vraiment faire beaucoup parler d'eux, puisque à la place... Euh, de l'habituelle euh, photo avec un candidat euh, ici qui a été d'ailleurs tiré au sort parmi les volontaires il y a un miroir et un, un slogan qui dit euh, qui est la, quelle est la, la meilleure personne pour euh, me représenter et en fait ce miroir vous vous penchez devant et vous vous rendez compte que c'est vous même donc c'est tout l'esprit euh, de cette euh, expérience très radicale euh, encore une fois, qui émerge euh, et qui est intéressante à regarder en ce qu'elle exprime euh, aussi une vraie créativité sur la façon de dialoguer et de poser l'action politique. Alors, à l'extrême inverse du spectre et de l'expérience politique aujourd'hui, il y a euh, l'expérience Syriza avec Andreas, qu'on a beaucoup de chance d'avoir avec nous, puisqu'Andreas fait, euh, fait partie des membres fondateurs de Syriza, euh, qui l'a fait partie du comité politique et organisationnel du mouvement, uh, Switch Back to English. Um, and, and I guess you have seen it all about what has happened to Syriza. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ecstatic moment of getting into power 
and the reality check of trying to rule. Um, this is really what I would like to know now. Um, it's really um, uh, what you have experienced there um, in terms of a reality check. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. You are in the middle of a very important, huge fight. A huge movement is going on in France this last weeks. I mean, one and a half month, something like that, two months. Um, yeah, I have a lot of things that I, a lot of thoughts that I would like to share with you. And I will begin by giving you my understanding of what happened in last, last summer in Greece which is relevant with the title of the, this panel, why do we need to rescue politics and Europe? Um, what we experienced uh, last summer, according to my understanding, was the defeat of the traditional political methodology of mobilizing, organizing, and acting. Uh, if you think about it, the Greek people did whatever um, they could the last five, six years, we had huge mobilizations. When I first joined the organized, uh, let's say, um, left organized uh, life, I was taught that our horizon of doing politics is to have a huge um, movement in every village, in every city, in every area of the country. We, we witnessed a a movement like that twice in Greece in 2011. Then the other thing that we used to to be taught, that that's, that's what we should be doing, is to engage in electoral politics, trying to change the balance of forces at the, at the parliament and hopefully form a government. We did that, I mean, the Greek people did that. Uh, a, a government uh, willing to deliver a message from the Greek people to the elites uh, was elected. Uh, and we know, after the last summer, that what we know how to do is not working. It's not sufficient. I'm not suggesting that we should stop fighting in the streets or stop engaging in electoral politics, but something is missing because we cannot have the results that we thought that we will have if we engage in this kind of processes. So yeah, that's my, my first uh, comment, that we know now something that we didn't, I mean, for sure, which is totally different thing to have an assessment of what the European condition is uh, uh, regarding democracy and uh, uh, basic rights for the people. And it's totally different thing to have a fact that it's not like that. What we know how to do is not applicable to our situation anymore. Uh, but just to make this very clear, what you have experienced is that a movement that has been elected democratically cannot rule. So what you have experienced is that the elite clearly is not respecting the democratic process. Is that it? Yes. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The idea is that uh, w we used to to be trained to do politics in a context in which the elites are committed to the democratic uh, game, let's say. Um, if a government that they do not like get elected, they, sh they would respect, so to speak, the, the right to, per to implement its policy, I mean the government, and they would engage in a democratic uh, political um, effort to convince people that this government and this policy is not the right one, and through the dec democratic means of elections to replace this government at some point and uh, a new government of their preference to be elected. Okay, that was what we knew. Uh, we know now that they have constructed, so to speak, a, 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 a structure in EU and Eurozone that uh, deprives the state or the government, at least in the case of Greece, this is, uh, this is what, uh, what happened, uh, deprived the government or the state to, to apply the policies that the people 
uh, uh, said to the government to, to apply. Okay, so we are having a situation in which by extracting important powers from the state, um, such as liquidity function and funding, uh, they can have unchecked control in basic function of, s of Greek society, at least. Basi uh, they have unchecked control and they can decide um, through their anti-democratic institutions whether this society will have a functional banking system or um, a, a sufficient running of basic functions. Okay, that's that was our situation in, in uh, last summer, which means that uh, if you are not prepared uh, in the sense of acquiring a, an autonomy, an autonomy, in the sense of running basic social functions in a way that um, uh, takes you out from the control of these uh, institutions, you are not able to defy their privileged access to crucial decisions such as what is going to happen with the banking system, what is going to happen with the pensions. Uh, if you want to seriously challenge this um, control of your society, you have to create a network of autonomous ways of performing basic social functions. Otherwise, you are being um, you you are being exposed to the threat of shutting down these basic social functions. And that's what we know, and we know that it's not. Uh, we have to shift to say one of the conclusions because that's pretty obvious what happened. One of the co one of the conclusions that uh, me and other people are trying to elaborate in Greece is that we have to shift in our political methodology and organization, uh, organization, organizational principles, we have to switch the ba shift the balance from representing demands and beliefs in a system that is intolerable, intolerant to these kind of demands, to a, w a way of organizing, nurturing, coordinating, connecting people's own actions in order to create popular power to be able to perform basic social functions in an autonomous way because that's what we need in order to defy uh, the control of these anti-democratic institutions on society. So just to make sure that I have uh, gotten this, what you are saying is that uh, playing the game, which is building a movement getting elected, getting into power, and trying to rule in today's Greek, Greece, is not something that is working. To many extents, I believe Greece is at the forefront of uh, what is Europe, what Europe can become. So to me, it is very, uh, a super interesting um, lesson to have in mind. Uh, to understand where we should place our energy uh, if we want to reclaim people's power. <laughs> Birgitta, you are about, or you may will, or we all wish you will, <laughs> take power playing the rule. You have really played by the rule. You have built uh, several political movements. Um, the last one is really uh, kicking um, you know what. Uh, it may be a matter of time before you get into power. What is your plan? Do you believe that you will be able to circumvent the obstacle that Syriza has met uh, in his country? And maybe, of course, you are not in the same situation regarding Europe that may help. Uh, okay, so uh, one week in politics is very long. <laughs> uh, as we've seen in the last, um, well, last years in Iceland, um, so nobody ever expected the Icelandic Pirate Party to grow uh, and become the biggest party for more than a year uh, in the polls. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is going to happen when uh, elections come. We are going to have early elections. They are supposed to be in October, but I highly doubt that I can believe the current government, who is, by the way, and for some reason the Icelandic people decided to uh, 
vote for the very same people into power that put us into the fifth largest financial collapse in the history of the world, only four years after. So uh, I am really torn about um, the wisdom of the masses. It is very easy to lie to people and manipulate them, and the media plays a very big role in it. And one of the things that uh, you know I have put a lot of effort into is to strengthening access to the media to make proper news, but at the same time the media is only focusing on clicks. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, entertainment media that does not have really a lot of depth. Uh, the biggest media corporation in Iceland and the only privately owned corporation is uh, owned by one of the banksters. Uh, he just moved the uh, ownership to his wife. They have massive tax haven offshore companies that have basically sucked out a lot of money from Iceland and then they got to write off a lot of the debt. The game is rigged, I totally agree. It is a completely rigged game. The laws only apply and work for the 1% and then uh, they know how to manipulate and mess with them. Uh, whereas if you steal a bread, you will get punished. If you steal a bank or uh, rob a nation, you will not get punished. So in a sense, I it feels you know very sort of like an impossible thing to do. But at the same time, I have seen critical mass. And in Iceland, which is a tiny country with 330,000 people living in it, you can reach critical mass in a very positive, positive and informed way where people get really engaged. Or it can be used in a very negative way. So I, I have no idea the, the election campaign is starting and the attacks are very severe, it's really disgusting. And it seems like everything is fair in politics and, and character assassinations are just fine. So, but if we were in a position to, um, and I'm just putting all these because I don't want people to get massively disappointed if it doesn't <laughs> work. Uh, so if we would be given this trust, I think uh, it's fundamental to use this political and ethical crisis that we are in now to have a very short term, because it's only during times of crisis that you can shift things. And we are in a crisis now, and we have a very, very tiny window to get the new constitution that was written by and for the people of Iceland, a social agreement on how we should be reflected in our highest law. And if we can do that, it's already, it's been done by the people, even national referendum on it, then we can fundamentally change things. There are huge powers that have been trying to stop it from day one, including the current uh, president of Iceland. Now, thank God for the leaks, and thank oh, I love whistleblowers. Uh, it has been revealed that his wife, the first lady of Iceland, has um, um, a lot of uh, offshore uh, company or you know, uh, accounts, uh, both in Tortola and in other places. So it looks like that uh, his uh, sixth ruling will not uh, happen. He was going to run for the sixth time. There is no leader in Europe that has been <laughs> in power for so long except some kings and queens in England. <laughs> so um, we are dealing with massive fights. So I, I don't want to, like many people say, oh, Birgitta, you know, are you going to run for prime minister? And I said, no, 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 I'm running away from it because I don't want to, to reflect myself in the way in the system the way it's always been. So I want to, for example, it's the least popular uh, sort of job if you are in a position of power, like the least favorable position of power is the Speaker of the House. So I definitely would rather like to be the Speaker of the House and show that I truly respect the parliamentary place rather than uh, some ministries. Okay, but if, if in power, whatever, who's prime minister or whatever, if you have 25% of the seats, that's still a lot. How do you plan to rule to avoid uh, the problem and, uh, and the obstacles that Syriza has met? How, do you, how are you going to make it? Uh, how are you going to make it? Okay, so the plan is uh, to have a short uh, term and 10 year plan so that we will introduce the nation. But there is one thing that is very important, like uh, I don't know if you have coalition governments uh, here, but there is always coalition government in Iceland. And so what happens is that all the parties promise everything. Oh, we'll do this if we get uh, 
a hundred percent, you know, of the vote, which is completely unrealistic. So people come together after the elections and start to break the promises and bring forward the governmental agreement. I want people to break the promises in advance. Uh, that would be one way of uh, showing that people are willing to be honest in politics. Uh, we have a grassroots up approach, so uh, we've introduced Better Iceland, uh, where anybody, actually, that they don't have to be a pirate, can bring forward an idea on a, a digital platform um, that is super user-friendly. And um, the idea that would get 2% uh, of Icelanders to say we want this will become uh, debated, debatable in the parliament. Uh, in the new constitution, it's even a stronger uh, dynamics about this uh, bottom-up uh, approach. 2% of Icelanders can uh, request the part or demand that the parliament uh, puts a law into action, for example, to have even further democracy in the new const in a new constitution, uh, and then the parliament has to put in a national referendum. So we plan to uh, our main aim is to both bring laws into the 21st century where all our lives have been digitized, and to be the Robin Hoods of power in reality, where we take the power from the powerful and hand it to the general public. And we have already mapped out how we're gonna do that, but you have to make the others that you have to work with uh, get on board. So I've been applying this pressure for a short term uh, because the only way to change the constitution is to have uh, two governments agree to it. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I really hope that we will do this because this is the only window I see. And I think another thing that we need to do is to learn from one another. All these different movements in Europe, we're all doing things that are inspired by the same idea. So when we discover the systems no longer work for us, and that is the main reason why people are coming out in these masses, the systems are not serving the people, then we have to offer something new. And uh, that's one of the things that the pirates are doing. Syriza was offering something new. The Five Star Movement is offering something new. Uh, my Voices uh, or My Voice is offering something new. Uh, and Podemos. But how could we work together? I think that is the big challenge and I think we should do it. It looks like it's a trial and error experiment. And to me, acknowledging it like it is, a trial and error experiment, is a good way to not be stopped by the fact that it's not working, because anyway, it's not going to work <laughs> in the short term. Um, ma voix, um, en quoi l'expérience des pirates uh, en Islande vous inspire, et, et vous-même, si vous entrez au Parlement, quand est, comment est-ce que vous allez uh, gouverner Comment est-ce que vous allez éviter ce qui s'est passé pour Syriza, c'est-à-dire euh, l'espèce d'enfermement euh, et puis progressivement euh, euh, l'espèce de hold-up de la parole politique. Alors, euh, tout d'abord, le premier parallèle qu'on peut faire, c'est euh, on a le, la même idée de vouloir retransmettre réellement le choix des électeurs. Euh, ça, c'est clair. Après, euh, la grande différence aussi, c'est que ma voix n'a aucun programme. Euh, on vise les élections législatives de 2017 pour pouvoir justement euh, représenter réellement euh, la voix des électeurs. Euh, C'est pour nous, en fait, euh, un choix de positionnement qui permet d'éviter les étiquettes politiques et qui permet réellement d'être dans la co-construction ensemble euh, de quelque chose de nouveau. Parce que c'est clair qu'on euh, va essayer, on va avancer en tant que pionnier. Donc, euh, on y va, tous ceux qui ont envie peuvent venir avec nous. Alors, pour être un petit peu plus, un petit peu plus précis, euh, on, on va tenter de recueillir euh, pour chaque loi qui va être votée euh, au Parlement, euh, l'avis des électeurs sur une plateforme. Alors, ça peut sembler un peu trop numérique, mais on peut aussi recueillir l'avis des électeurs de façon locale, hein, lors de rencontres locales. Le but est de connaître euh, le, le, le sentiment, l'opinion des électeurs et de retranscrire cette opinion 
au niveau du Parlement. Alors, avant d'émettre une opinion, euh, les lecteurs, il va falloir qu'ils se forment, qu'ils s'informent euh, pour, euh, pour connaître justement le contexte. Il va falloir qu'ils débattent aussi avec euh, peut-être des experts ou peut-être des gens euh, motivés et intéressés par tel ou tel sujet. Et une fois qu'il aura euh, connaissance de cause de la loi, il bah, pourra voter, il pourra donner son avis pour ou contre ou s'abstenir. Une fois que tous les électeurs de ma voix auront fait ça, euh, on va recueillir la proportion de pour, de contre, d'abstention. Et on va demander aux députés ma voix, qui seront élus, de retranscrire cette même proportion. En gros, si pour euh, un, une loi, euh, allez, je vais vous donner un exemple, euh, on veut décider que... Euh, euh, les cantines, euh, les cantines n'auront que du bio à l'école. Euh, Peut-être qu'il y aura 70% des gens de ma voix qui seront pour, 30 contre. Dans ce cas-là, on va demander, admettons qu'on a 10 députés, aux 10 députés ma voix de voter dans les mêmes proportions, c'est-à-dire 7 pour et 3 contre, quel que soit leur avis personnel. Um, Nicolas, I would like to go back to you because you are exactly building, and you have been working on that for a long time, what Birgitta was mentioning, which is uh, trying to um, install a dialogue or a common uh, movement, a common approach uh, in various countries through this movement, uh, the M25. Why do you think, uh, what is it, by the way, Can you explain to us uh, what is the goal, what is the, the basis of the movement, and why do you think it's going to work? Or not, by the way. Okay. Um, I will answer your question, but what I think is more important also for answering the question is to come back to the experience of Greece over the last year. Because um, I think it says some we have to be very precise about what the problem was to be able to say something precise about democracy in Europe, which actually is the title of DM25, Democracy in Europe Movement 25. Um, in Greece, there was a radical government that was elected uh, that wanted uh, radically to change uh, the conditions in the country, to change the policies of the country, and also to a change policies of the European Union and the Troika that applied to the country. Um, as you all know, there was a referendum Oh, he won the referendum. Uh, we were happy to reject the uh, bailout offer that was uh, put forward. And then, a week later, 10 days later, the European Council forced uh, the same bailout uh, agreement that had been rejected by the Greek people down the throat of, of Tsipras. Now, um, what's happened there, I agree, is a disrespect of democracy. But at the European Council, uh, an argument that's made very quickly Uh, by Schaubler and others is, well, the Greeks have got their democracy, every other European country's got their democracy as well, and, you know, we need to respect everybody's democracy here. Greece is only one country amongst others. This is to totally misrepresent uh, what the problem is. The problem is not, I would argue, that the Greek people and the Greek government didn't get exactly what they would like, design totally their own uh, bailout clause, design precisely exactly the way all the other European countries uh, should uh, deal with the situation of debt in Greece. That's not the problem. That would be an illegitimate expectation in the European <laughs> Union, which does require, uh, and let alone in a common currency, which does require some negotiation and sharing of sovereignty. I'm particularly sensible to that because you might guess by my accent, I'm from London, and we have a big debate at the moment about what sharing sovereignty means. And I think it's important to understand that if you want to take part in the European Union, you can't expect to have everything totally your own way. But that's not what the Greek people were asking. The Greek people were asking, I would, uh, I, I would, I would suggest, and were even uh, shouting, that the current agreement uh, not only is terrible economics, which provides no route uh, either for Greece to get out of the crisis or, I would suggest, for the euro to get out of the crisis, ultimately, but has terrible social implications in Greece. And so this kind of agreement uh, is a total humiliation of Greece. And what's even worse is when the Greek had the courage to say that uh, at the European Council, they were humiliated even more by a total failure, a deliberate failure to hear that message and attempt to ram 
uh, that uh, bailout policy, uh, as I say, down the throats of Tsipras. Now, I say that's a, de uh, a, a, a um, denial of democracy and also uh, basic uh, tenets of uh, solidarity. I would also, and I think this is important, say that it's a denial, actually a violation, of what the European Union stands for. I'll do something very boring, but which I think is important. I'll read to you two articles of the founding treaty of the European Union. Article 2, the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and the respect of human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Uh, these values are common to member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. Article 3, the Union's aim is to promote peace, its values and the well-being of its peoples. The Union should offer the citizens an area of freedom, security and justice. The Union shall establish an internal market. It shall work for the sustained development of Europe based on balanced economic growth and price stability a competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress. I stop there. You all agree, exactly. Uh, but can we say that the uh, recent decisions of the European Union live up to those articles? I would argue not at all. And there should be legal challenges in the European Union to say that the founding, um, the founding principles of the European Union have been violated. When Schaubler has to argue, uh, as he has, a great deal over the past two years that there's no possibility of a bailout uh, of a transfer of funds from Germany to Greece. He has to choose very obscure articles way down the European treaties that you really have to search for and then try and understand. You can read articles two and three. You don't have to read very far to see that the current European Union uh, policies are totally out of line with what the European Union is meant to stand for. And that brings me to answer to your question. What is DM? DM is the uh, simple statement that uh, Europe has to be democratized or it will disintegrate. And the disintegration of Europe, the European Union, will lead to uh, the rise of populist and far right uh, causes. Um, and that is not a, pro a promising future for this continent. And so we have to, by 2025 is where the 25 comes from, work to democratize the European Union. Diem is a very young uh, organization. It was started just this year. It was launched in Berlin. I can say that its strategy uh, up until now has been one of trying to occupy the media space with this message. You can tell already the way it was introduced. Yanis Varoufakis, Julian Assange, Zizek, and so on. These are media personalities who can command a certain attention, and we need to use the attention that they can command to pass this message, because very few people can pass that message into the public sphere at the moment. The organization that I'm the chair of, European Alternatives, has been working for 10 years with a slightly different strategy, firstly of linking up movements throughout uh, Europe at a very grassroots level, and secondly of going into the institutions, the European institutions in Brussels, in Strasbourg, and elsewhere, and arguing on behalf of citizens, going there as citizens, arguing on behalf of citizens. You may not know, but the institutions are quite open, actually, you hear all the time about corporate lobbyists going to influence the European decision makers. How do they get in? Well, they can get in the same way you can get in. Uh, you can go in and argue. And the number of times I've been in meetings where I've listened to lobbyist after lobbyist after lobbyist representing corporate interests and then stood up and say, hey, you know what? I want to say something on behalf of citizens. And everybody looks at me like I'm a total imposter. Well, I say we should be there in, en masse. Uh, it requires a certain degree of organization. Um, and it's clearly not going to change the whole problem, uh, but it's an important strategy. At the moment, we leave the space totally open uh, for totally undemocratic forces, and that's what we need to work to change. But I would just need you to go a little bit more specific on DEM25, even though I understand this is not the only movement you're taking care of. Uh, just tell me about the five key focus that... Um, DM, DM25 is trying to push the agenda uh, that is really at the core, because it's not only uh, Yanis uh, Varoufakis and Julian Assange teaming up to do a political movement. There's really a vision about Europe, about the theme, about the very topic that, are, um, that we are facing, that to me is nowhere in the current European agenda, or, or super badly um, 
how do you say that? Super badly addressed. Yeah. Just one question. This is this is a really good question. It's one that those <laughs> absolutely, and this is this is something that those of us who've been trying to work with the movement have been have been making very forcefully as an argument. Um, the um, the key uh, areas that DM's uh, been trying to prioritize is coming up with a program for uh, a kind of green new deal uh, for the European Union. Uh, so a plan of relaunching the economy based on investment, also sorting out the mess uh, with the banks, which is actually at the origin of the euro crisis and its perpetuation and hasn't been dealt with at all properly uh, through the measures that have been taken over the past couple of years. Um, in coming up with a radically different uh, migration policy, uh, there's actually a meeting happening right now in Vienna these days, today and tomorrow, bringing together movements from throughout Europe to talk about what that migration policy should be as part of Diem. Uh, there's the uh, proposal, or there's the imperative to uh, revise the constitution of the European Union um, and to, to have a kind of popular writing of um, the constitution. And uh, throughout each of those themes, and they're not the only themes, there are, there are more being uh, added, the approach is always to bring people together from throughout Europe to begin with, and then um, uh, that they go and, and campaign in their countries rather than trying to do things the other way around. I should mention that the um, first and in a way very important campaign of Diem, which is running right at the moment, is one for transparency. Uh, it's calling for uh, things that seem as simple as the minutes of uh, meetings of the European Council or the Eurogroup uh, to be made public. Uh, for those parts of the European institutions which are taking decisions to do so in public and not in private, uh, for the details regarding uh, trade negotiations, we think of TTIP to be uh, transparent and publicly available. So this campaign for transparency is one that we've started with in DM and is clearly in some ways a prerequisite for doing serious democratic reform afterwards. Andreas, I would like to go back to you because you are the one here that have experience power in the reality check, uh, really, of power. Uh, it seems to me that all of these movements are looking to um, are looking for resilience in society to bring back the power or some power or some empowerment to people. But to me, the question, and we can see it with the big phantom, uh, big elephant in the room today, which is Nuit de Bouy is not here, I'm sorry, but we are all, uh, of course, uh, are thinking about what they are doing right now. And I kind of understand that the main question today is how to pursue the movement, how to get organized, how to resist time, how to resist uh, apathy, how to resist uh, the media um, <coughs> angle that uh, inevitably are gonna are gonna come over. So to me, the big questions is how um, to make those movement that are seeking to install resiliency or resilience, sorry, in society. How to make them resilient? So what is your approach to that, Andreas? To create resilience is something that we. I mean, it's not something new. I mean, you need community control over infrastructure data reserves, as we were uh, listening in the previous panel, you need um, some kind of control in distribu distribution networks, you need productive uh, units that have a cooperative uh, integrated um, system of, uh, of, of connection. There are ways of, of, of performing, of, of, of describing what we should be doing in order to achieve resilience. The fact the problem is that we don't have uh, this kind of initiatives, this kind of um, work is not considered to be a political work. Okay, it, it's, it's um, I mean, I was taught and I truly believe that it's, it could, it, it, it tends to be marginalized by the people that are involved in this because they are working a lot on the, on the field, they are trying to build something, it's difficult to upscale, okay. But I was trying to, to think what a political organization should be doing in a situation like this. What we have to offer, I mean, I'm talking about myself, I was a 
member of a political organization for 18 years, what my duty should be now? I mean, uh, it, since political representation and um, a political representation is not enough, okay? I, I'm not suggest or fighting in the streets or demonstrating is not enough. I repeat myself, myself, I'm not saying that they are not, that these are things and activities that we, sh we should be, we should stop doing, but a political organization could, should have today a mandate of pro offering a backbone, um, the nodes of a network that connects, nurtures, coordinates, uh, transfer know-how know -how and best practices in order to upscale this kind of initiatives to, to, make, it, to make people um, begin to do, to, 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 take, to take part of this kind of initiatives more easily than now. So there is a whole um, set of services and duties for a political organization that transcend transcend what we used to think um, as being a political uh, activity, okay. But it, I would say that if we go a hundred, a hundred years ago, and if we th if we see what the political organizations of the end at the end of the 19th century and the beginnings of the 20th century were doing, you would see that uh, you will realize that they were doing the same thing because it, it was a hostile political context. They were arrested, they, they, nobody would listen to them. I mean, the demonstrations or the movements were hit badly. Something like what is going on uh, every day here um, in Europe the last few years. So, yeah, we, we can reinvent um, the role of political organization if we, take the, if we take the right lessons from what we are experiencing in Europe. And uh, I strongly believe, because I want to be optimistic I, as much as possible, that there are a lot of components, ingredients, and um, that we can make use in order to create such a network and create um, a, net a network of uh, autonomous uh, functions, basic social functions, that I believe that it's the key point in order to have a leverage in this fight. Uh, there are a lot of components. We don't have to invent something. Um, what we need to do is to to, uh, to combine them properly, uh, to fantasize, to envision an organizational and operational DNA that can actually be effective in small groups or larger groups of people because we know from our experience that our political organizations and our initiatives suffer dramatically in terms of democratic function and in terms of being efficient in cooperating. I mean, the people who, do, I mean, people tend to work together in our initiatives and they are less productive than, than when they work to alone, which is contradiction because we believe in democracy, we believe in cooper cooperation, but we do not really we haven't really found a way of being truly efficient in actually doing what we are saying that w we would like the whole society to be doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Donc on dirait que la politique est morte, mais vive la politique. Euh, je voudrais vous ouvrir euh, les questions, le champ des questions. Il nous reste 10 minutes. Euh, voilà, je voulais savoir si vous aviez quelques questions pour ces deux interlocuteurs. Si vous n'en avez pas, j'en ai d'autres, ne vous inquiétez pas. Ah. Oui, bonjour, merci d'être venu. Est-ce qu'on peut imaginer un regroupement des partis PJDA, Podemos, euh, Diem et moi en Europe avec une possibilité peut-être de, de créer une dynamique européenne vous voulez dire au-delà de ce que fait Diem25 Tout à fait, oui. Oui, je pensais que vous voulez dire euh, Podemos plutôt que Peggy euh, dans, dans notre question, mais oui, je, je, tout à fait. Et on travaille, euh, on travaille dans ce sens avec Diem. Euh, 
C'est un, un, un grand débat, je, pour être honnête, dans, dans DiEM. Si ça doit travailler pour devenir un parti politique, euh, il y a des représentants de Podemos là-dedans, il y a des représentants de euh, Bloco de Esquerca en, en, au Portugal, à Matisse Mateas, par exemple, qui était candidat à la présidentielle. Il y a Caroline Lucas de, des Verts en Angleterre qui, qui en fait partie. Donc, il y a des acteurs politiques. Il y a même euh, Cécile Duflot a participé dans le lancement euh, à Berlin. Ça a été un grand débat si ces responsables politiques doivent en faire partie vraiment du mouvement ou non, si on doit travailler dans le sens d'essayer de faire un regroupement euh, mon avis, c'est qu'il faut essayer de le faire. Il faut, on a plus de chances de le faire avec des nouveaux acteurs qu'avec des anciens acteurs qui ont des, des mentalités tout à fait différentes. Et euh, en France, je crois que c'est très frappant euh, à gauche, euh, les, surtout les attitudes par rapport à la coopération européenne. Donc euh, moi, je crois que c'est possible. Ce n'est peut-être pas possible tout de suite parce que les mouvements ne sont pas encore aussi forts, les partis politiques ne sont pas aussi forts. Mais c'est clair qu'avec les résultats des élections en Espagne, ça peut donner un espoir dans ce sens aussi. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, because we had a lot of debates in Iceland if we should unify all the left-wing parties and something, because, for example, the pirates do not consider themselves to be a, a left or right-wing party. We're trying to approach politics from a different angle uh, and look at the, the, the bigger picture uh, and offer new alternatives. I think rather than trying to group all these different parties together, because usually it's a disaster to try to bring very different groups together, <laughs> it just always ends in a disaster. I think it would be better to start by creating a really powerful think tank where we can work together uh, and share knowledge uh, through a think tank format. Because um, uh, when you start to work on the political uh, agenda in the political space, It's a very uh, ugly space. I, I used to work in a fish factory uh, in the old days and I would put on a specific year before I went into the fish factory and I often feel like I do the same thing when I go into the parliament. Yeah, <laughs> 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 wait, no. then we're never going to make the changes that we need to see. Okay, uh, so I actually helped create a political movement uh, in Iceland in the wake of uh, all the protests in 2008 that was sort of a... Um, a coalition of all the different grassroots movements because we realized that uh, uh, you needed somebody on the inside to try to understand how things work. I still think that is a very good approach. Uh, even if you only get three people in, they can facilitate uh, uh, information and corner off the ministers uh, in the cafeteria, always very useful. But uh, the I, what I would advise you, and this is the first step we did uh, before we even thought about uh, making it into a political movement, was to call together a meeting of all the different groups that were organizing and ask them what are the three most important things that you feel that needs to be done first. So if you simplify uh, and unify about find out what are the things that you agree that you need to do first to fundamentally change things, then that will make uh, the next steps a lot easier. Uh, just the elites have already made their minds. All we have to do is to embrace the fact that they are going to hit us in every possible way. 
and we have to fight back. And it won't be easy. It won't be a one-stop um, one-stop goal. It will be a hard, long fight. We are just in the beginning of a transition f uh, era for Europe, and not only for Europe. Uh, with with the, the the stakes are too high. It's even higher than we realize or we let ourselves to realize. So we have to be patient. We have to learn uh, and adapt all the time from what we are doing, why it's not working, why it's working, and how we can expand it. We have to connect, and we have to be um, happy for what is going on to us because w we are the generations that take on the um, honorable duty of saving humankind in a very crucial point of our evolutionary history. So we have to be calm and we have to be determined. We don't, we, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't wait for a compromise for the, the opponents are not going to compromise. So we are in, uh, engaged in a glorious fight. Would you say that? Would you say uh, all of you? Would you say that um, to answer your question, or to maybe to build on this, um, that we should get rid of many things, but maybe one of the crucial things to get rid of is the belief that we can change the things overnight. Like Le Grand Soir is not something that we should believe in. That's going to be very long and very painful. But yes. If you ask me, I mean, we need a permanent methodology strategy in order to t make use of long uh, of, of big nights, of big events. Okay, we tend to fantasize and envision social change as a one night um, action. And we uh, do not have a more permanent strategy of transformation and um, uh, dissemination in, in, in society of our logic, okay, of our ways of doing things. Uh, and that's why we cannot take advantage of big uh, events that change drastically the balance of forces. So yes, raptures can be done, and that's what history taught us. But we have to be there having a long-term strategy of transformation in order to make use of them. Okay, on peut prendre une dernière question. Oh, sorry. One sentence, I think there's many things to get rid of, but the first thing to get rid of for Nuit Debout is this labor law reform. I think that some focus, although I think it's great that there's many different issues that are brought up, the, the left in Europe needs a victory. Nuit Debout is part of a potential victory here in France to have the rejection of this labor law, and I think some focus on making that happen would give a huge boost uh, right around the continent. Vous avez une dernière question, oui. Mais je voudrais savoir quelle, euh, quelle serait la stratégie pour, euh, pour protéger l'information, non pas euh, pour protéger les lanceurs d'alerte, mais pour diffuser l'information, pour garantir que celle-ci ne soit pas détournée par rapport euh, aux médias actuels qui font euh, une propagande complètement à l'inverse de, de ce qu'on peut attendre des lanceurs d'alerte. Voilà. Alors il y a une histoire de travail avec Inui. Mais euh, voilà, je voulais voir un peu le, le point de vue de tout le monde pour essayer de synchroniser un peu cette, cette force de médias alternatives. Uh, ok, so information is um, a huge problem in the sense that we have an information overload. Uh, and when I was uh, volunteering for WikiLeaks, when we were at the time getting the biggest data dump in the history of humankind, um, it was crucial when we were analyzing um, the Afghan warlocks to get people that understand the military lingo. Uh, you know, it's all in acronyms and so forth. So it's not enough just to get a big data dump online. There are also were names of people there that if they were not reducted, were put in danger. So um, <coughs> I know that many people are um, still waiting for a lot of the information from Snowden, from um, Panama leaks and various other leaks. Uh, and uh, I actually thought it was, uh, I was really quite happy with seeing all these different investigative journalists from all over the world uh, 
figuring and spending 10 months on analyzing the data for the first lack of that news. Uh, if we have alternative media, how can we be sure that it's not infiltrated by <laughs> uh, secret services? Uh, I have been a part of a grassroots group in Iceland, of all places, uh, where we got uh, a spook from the UK pretending to be one of us, and that was just uh, revealed later. So it's, uh, I, I think it is very hard to verify if documents are not fake. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I've been in this process, and it is very hard to know, uh, you know, if leaks are uh, done by honorable decisions. Um, and I, I think that there is no simple solution for this. But uh, maybe just like the investigative journalists have banded together to work together, uh, alternative media should work more together because there are a lot of really good alternative media, but uh, it's not the only solution. Uh, we just need to turn off our tele televisions, and the young generation has already done it, so uh, let's get our parents and grandparents to turn off the tele. <laughs> Je, je, puisque c'est un tout petit peu ma partie, je, je vais me permettre de répondre, enfin pas de répondre, mais d'essayer de contribuer, puisque c'est quelque chose auquel je suis confrontée, moi, professionnellement. Euh, je pense que vous avez raison, c'est consubstantiel à la crise démocratique dans laquelle on est. Euh, mais je pense qu'on est tous responsables, parce qu'on a tous cru que l'information gratuite, c'était euh, quelque chose, c'était le nec plus ultra, c'était un confort, c'était exactement la, la suite logique, enfin pas la suite, mais une partie de ce qu'aurait pu expliquer Evgeny Morozov, à partir du moment où on a considéré que l'information était une commodité, ben on l'a tuée. Donc euh, le résultat, c'est que les journalistes n'ont plus les moyens d'être payés et puis qu'on ne paye plus personne pour aller faire des vraies enquêtes euh, d'investigation parce que nous, lecteurs, on a décidé de ne plus payer l'information. Donc il y a un vrai problème de modèle économique qui, du coup, est complètement écrasé et qui bénéficie totalement à, au monopole des médias détenus par, euh, par des intérêts privés. Et si on veut que ça soit plus le cas... Eh ben, il faut que le lecteur, de la même manière qu'il re-rentre en politique, il re-rentre dans une démarche où il veut être informé, c'est-à-dire qu'il soutienne ses journalistes. Peut-être qu'on va arriver sur des modèles qui sont en train d'arriver, de journalistes crowdfundés pour leurs enquêtes. Euh, Peut-être qu'il faut rétablir le lien entre journalistes et lecteurs. Euh, mais en tout cas, c'est une profession qui est au cœur euh, de la démocratie et qui, aujourd'hui, euh, n'a plus les moyens de faire son travail. Et je pense, honnêtement, qu'on est tous responsables de ce situation. Pardon d'avoir, euh, excusez-moi vraiment, <laughs> d'avoir uh, hijacké um, la fin de ce débat. Uh, I thank you very, very much for your time and your experience. Uh, comme vous avez vu, on a tous à apprendre de ce qui est en train de se passer. Rien n'est simple. On est en pleine courbe d'apprentissage. C'est aussi quelque chose d'assez fabuleux à vivre. Il y a beaucoup de, de deuil et de désillusion à passer, mais on est en haut aussi d'une belle page blanche. Enfin, moi, c'est comme ça que j'ai envie de la voir. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Okay, uh, I have one thing for you guys to do. Think about yourself in 25 years. In what sort of community do you want to live? And talk about it with somebody during this event.